So uh, thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. I will quickly introduce myself uh, that you understand from whence I'm talking. Um, and I'll go straight to the points of my presentation. So um, as has been said, uh, my name is Alexandre Monin. I'm a philosopher with uh, a weird um, career. Uh, I've been working for some years in the field of uh, everything that is digital. I did my PG thesis at uh, Sorbonne on the philosophy and the architecture of the web. And I've been working for like 15 years and more on issues that deal with the web and ICT, digital technologies. Um, I was uh, working at INRIA, which is a kind of French MIT for three years. It's the public research center dedicated to digital technologies. And there I began questioning myself about the future of ICT, about ecological issues. Um, and in parallel, I was working with some people inside an independent laboratory uh, that is called Origins Media Lab, and which is entirely dedicated to studying the Anthropocene. And uh, eventually I quit my job, my position at INRIA, and um, I began working with a friend of mine who was already working in uh, a business school in Clermont. Um, and there we were able to go on working together on various programs, lots of which I will uh, present today. And this is where we developed the idea of ecological redirection, uh, which I will introduce you to in this uh, presentation. So the title of this presentation is Ecological Redirection, a paradigm that differs from sustainable development, CSR and resilience. I won't necessarily be talking about all these existing paradigms because maybe you know about them, or maybe we'll be able to exchange uh, during the discussion about these paradigms, but I will try rather to introduce what we understand by ecological redirection and the kind of actions we're pursuing uh, under this banner. So uh, the first notion I want to introduce here is the notion of legacy. Uh, as you see on this figure, the schema, and this is a contrast between um, the biosphere and let's say the technosphere, what some researchers are calling the technosphere, meaning everything that was built, especially during the last two and a half centuries. Uh, these infrastructures that constitute and make the world that we know right now and that weighs more than currently than the biosphere, meaning that we do not leave only, of course, you probably know that already, but in nature, but we also live inside infrastructures. And part of the issue right now is how we deal with the technosphere, what we do about that, and often the attitude of researchers or people critical of these elements is just to criticize them. Um, not just built elements, infrastructure, but also economic models, business models, and the likes, or supply chains, everything that con constitutes our world. And with Diego Olivasso, a friend with whom we developed this notion of ecological redirection, we thought that criticism wasn't enough to really take care of this, because you may criticize capitalism, of course, that will not make it disappear. That's obvious, but it's all, all, always well worth restating. Uh, you can criticize an infrastructure, it doesn't make it disappear. And whether this infrastructure is here for long term or not, whether it's a good idea to have it, um, it won't change its course. So the question is, how do we deal with these um, entities outside of the traditional attitude, which is just to criticize them and to maybe write a paper or write a book but the paper, nor the paper, neither the paper nor the book will do the job of what's needed to deal with these realities. So how do we deal with such realities? How do we inherit them? That's one big question for us. 
And the other question is if these realities are not sustainable, and lots of those, of course, are not sustainable, how do we shut them down? How do we dismantle these realities, like concretely? And here the knowledge to do, to do so is often lacking. There is, of course, a lot of teachings in business schools and elsewhere about innovation, how to innovate, how to produce new stuff, new things. There, is, there are ongoing studies about uh, alternative to innovation, like uh, um, repair studies, maintenance studies, so insisting on the importance of maintenance and uh, uh, repairing is one move beyond innovation. But maybe that's not enough. And there is very little about shutting things down, getting rid of them in the proper way, dismantling them, disaffecting them to reaffect them to something else. And this is precisely what we think is especially important um, in light of the Anthropocene and uh, whatever. So to, yeah, that's the cover of a book we published last spring. Uh, it's called precisely Legacy and Closure and Eco Ecology of uh, Dismantling. And um, that was written by myself, Diego Nodiva, and Emmanuel Bonnet. It's kind of a summary of our program. To contrast this, um, the view I want to introduce you to with existing views, especially CSR and others, uh, with the kind of framing that is extremely important in global policy about ecology, but also in CSR at the level of organizations and even elsewhere. I want to uh, read a quote from a book by a German political scientist named Stefan Eikut. Uh, it was published in French two years ago and it's entitled The Climatization of the World. And he describes the ongoing um, global policy about climate change and ecological issues. And he says this, this model is based on so-called end-of-pipe measures. We'll try to regulate outputs and therefore greenhouse gas emissions. International negotiations will therefore mainly concern the distribution of the global effort to reduce emissions. On the other hand, we will not tackle the question of inputs, the processes that determine the evolution of emissions, such as energy production, industrial, development models, or the functioning of the world economy. And so basically what he's explaining in this book is that at the level of, on the, well, let's say on the side of a strategy uh, and the core functioning of the world organizations, uh, the IMF and others, um, it's, what is fixed is the strategy that countries will follow in order to maximize their development, basically for what reason that remains to be discussed, but basically that's that. And then you have other institutions uh, like the IPCC, the IBES and others, uh, which are raising the alarm about uh, climate change, about um, planetary boundaries and the likes. Because of course the problem is not just about uh, climate change, far from that. And they do not have the power to weight on the policies that are being adopted. Uh, and the measures they can recommend here uh, are only um, not strategic, but tactical measures. And lots of these tactical measures are about how we may separate our activity from the consequences of our activity. By using more efficient technologies, for example, uh, that will need less energy, that we have a, a, a smaller output in terms of green gas, um, greenhouse gas emissions and the likes. And so the, the framing of the international order uh, ecological issue is precisely that the policies are set 
at the strategic level and what remains to be done at a tactical level are mainly um, technological solutions because this framing mainly allows for technological solutions, tactical solutions that will not tackle the causes of what is really happening. Uh, like the imperative of growth, development, and the likes. So there is this idea of separating one's core activity from its consequences through uh, energy efficiency, technological efficiency, and the likes. Right. And this also applies to organizations. Uh, within organizations, lots of organizations have a core activity, uh, and this activity sometimes has bad consequences for the environment, and the issue is how we may diminish these uh, bad consequences, sometimes framed as unforeseen consequences. As if we were able to detach consequences from causes, or to min minimize consequences. But the point rather, and I will try to explain that and also maybe during the discussion, is that a lot of these consequences are not really consequences. They are rather requirements. If you are producing chocolate, for example, well, that will probably need you to cut down trees and forests and destroy forests. That's not a unforeseen consequence of your activity. That's a requirement for your activity. And that is, of course, very, very different. And to deal with a consequence and to deal with a requirement are two different things. And mainly, uh, what I want to stress here is a reframing of the issue from a tactical issue to a strategic issue from an issue that leaves aside and touched the core activity of countries and organizations to a framing that raises the question of maintaining or not some core activities of countries or organizations. And maybe shutting down some activities because we won't be able to detach or minimize their consequences, or even maybe won't be able to simply go on with these activities. So uh, in my work and in the book you've seen, there is a, a notion I introduce, which I will talk uh, about a little bit here, which is a notion of negative comments. You probably know the um, notion of commons that was, uh, um, should I say, uh, put forward very strongly by uh, um, political scientist Elna Ostrom, who received the no well, so-called Nobel Prize of Economy for her work on the commons, uh, where a, a commons basically, and that's a very bad characterization of this notion, but a commons is uh, a, a reality or resource that is um, maintained or managed by a community that gives itself democratic uh, rules of governance in order to do so. So you've got a resource, um, a community, and democratic rules of governance. And th those three elements uh, nowadays often characterize what a commons is. I think it's a very bad characterization, but I won't go into the details uh, here, and you can find alternative um, characterization. But this one is very, uh, very much shared. Um, but with the commons, and that's a question that is shared by both Eleanor Strom and uh, Garrett Harding, uh, the question is how to avoid the commons from being destroyed through consumption and whatever. Um, and that's a shared question. The, the answer of Garrett Harding and Eleanor Strom are, of course, widely different from one another, but still their basic 
question is more or less the same. Um, it struck me that what is maybe the, the most prevalent question right now, if we begin thinking about legacy and legacies in the plural, is how, what exactly we're going to inherit and things, of course, whose very existence may be threatening um, the inhabitability on Earth. And how do we do with that? How do we deal with that? How do we deal not with realities, resources that everyone wants to appropriate, but rather how do we deal with realities that no one wants to appropriate, but that we will nevertheless have to deal with um, and collectively? Like uh, polluted so uh, uh, soils, um, uh, f uh, abandoned infrastructures, and the likes. Um, yeah, depleted rivers, infrastructures in disarray, and the likes. It's more a question framed this way of institution than of resources. How do we organize the way we collectively deal with these realities instead of how do we uh, exploit resources in a sustainable way? Um, we cannot un align our understanding of negative commons and of what I call bucolic commons if we understand commons first and foremost as being resources, which is a problem to understand commons this way, anyway. Rather, we have to understand the commoning, the action of producing the commons, instituting the commons, has an institutional practice through which different realities are being acknowledged, has negative commons, and taken care of. Whether these realities are positive or negative, bucolic or negative. And the point here is we lack institutions to take care of negative commons. If we go back to my first slide on legacy, a lot of the elements of the technosphere precisely are what I call negative commons. Commons that um, no one wants really to uh, acknowledge has negative commons and appropriate has negative commons in order to take care of them, dismantle them. But negative commons because their very existence is threatening, again, the inhabitability of the Earth. So unlike traditional approaches like corporate social responsibility, which is uh, more interested in um, dealing with the consequences of um, the activity of organizations, detaching these consequences from these activities, which is basically, unfortunately, impossible. Unlike sustainable development, unlike green growth, ecological redirection considers uh, that it will not be possible to maintain everything, everything that we know um, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of living conditions and the likes. It will not be possible and it should not um, be possible to maintain everything, especially these elements that are threatening uh, the future. That uh, uh, Australian uh, designer Tony Fry says they are defuturing, meaning they are depriving us from a livable future. Uh, these elements should be um, taken care of. And so trade-offs will have to be made and actually are already being made. That's a very important point. And so the question is, how do we do that? How do we dismantle, shut down, and how do we uh, deal with these trade-offs? I said that trade-offs are already being made, and that's actually the case. Uh, unfortunately, generally, they're uh, unplanned. Um, done in an authoritarian way and they are unaware or unconcerned about the people involved. Um, and if you look at the news around the world, you will find a lot of trade-offs that are being made by some governments and unfortunately they belong to the kind I've just highlighted. Uh, unplanned, authoritarian and brutal 
for the people who are concerned. Because when we're talking about here shutting things down, dismantling and the likes, of course this has consequences over a lot of people. A lot of people attached to the realities that should not be maintained, which is a, uh, a central point here of uh, what I'm concerned with. And of course, what we should try to do is to um, promote and develop methodologies and means and institutions to deal with these uh, closures uh, in a planned, democratic, and concerned way, uh, concerned about the people who are involved and who will suffer the consequences of uh, shutting down these realities. Uh, so, I've been talking about negative commons. There are two ways uh, to understand negative commons. When I was first putting forward this notion back in 2017, um, I was unaware that the concept had been used by two German sociologists, Maria Mies and Veronika Benold Thompson. Um, I discovered that later, and then I wrote a, a paper which I sent uh, to your comrades about the history, let's say that, of negative commons, uh, which is quite interesting. But it led me to contrast two understandings of negative commons, one in terms of ruins, which I will develop in a moment, and one in terms of waste. And the two taken together are quite interesting because they open different um, um, should I say, a uh, uh, line of thought um, and, and path for research, but I will concentrate myself on uh, the understanding of negative commons has ruins. Um, of course, whenever one talk about ecological crisis, about the Anthropocene, about uh, maybe an impending collapse, and the collapse movement was very strong in France, um, before the advance of the COVID pandemic. Uh, but there was a really strong phenomenon around this notion of collapse that was uh, going on. Uh, one has in mind uh, picturesque um, images of forlorn realities, um, abandoned infrastructures, uh, or landscape of destruction. And this is basically um, the kind of aesthetics uh, you come to expect from the Anthropocene, when one is thinking about the Anthropocene. And this is what I'm calling ruined ruins, uh, ruins that look like uh, ruins, that look like picturesque ruins. Um, here is an example. This is a picture of the last coal-fired power facility operated by the U.S. Navy. And this other example here behind me is a cemetery of flood damaged cars. Um, and uh, you can see, so all these are basically uh, dead cars, uh, which are not usable anymore. And that's a lot of them. Um, but there are other ruins, maybe more interesting here, even though the question about ruined ruins is <clears throat> also a very important question. How do we deal with these realities that are accumulating? And we'll see that they are accumulating more and more uh, for good reasons. But the question is rather, how can we understand maybe a ruins in a different way? Uh, the German philosopher, I don't know if you know about him, is very famous, Walter Benjamin. Um, he was talking about ruins in his famous uh, unpublished uh, 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 book on passages. And um, in this book, and I won't hear um, comments on what he understood by this, but he explains uh, at some point um, that maybe the bourgeois city is the real ruin. The bourgeois city of his time is the real ruin. So the ruin is not the abandoned castle from the Middle Ages. It's rather the contemporary city he was uh, living in. And what strikes me as interesting with this notion of ruins is that maybe the real ruins are not ruins that we can readily identify as such. 
they are rather ruins because their functioning is destroying the world we live in. It's already destroying the world of some people, sometimes the people who are producing these elements, these artifacts, these devices. But their very functioning, not their destruction, is destroying the world we live in. Is waiting too much for the world we live in to go on. And one good example of that might be uh, the smartphone. I've got one, so I'm guilty myself. This is not about personal ethics, right? Uh, the, 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 the smartphone, because uh, as I said here on this uh, uh, image, a world of minerals is in your mobile device. And this, these are all the uh, ores that are necessary to build uh, a smartphone. It's like uh, uh, eighty percent of um, the elements that are known, and of course, it's already a ruin because, well, to produce a smartphone, you need uh, mines like this one and others. You need extractivism. Um, you need to have proto slaves that are producing those smartphones, and all these elements are linked together. But more than that, smartphones might be what uh, physicists. Uh, who's working in this very university, uh, José Alois, is, who maybe you... I think he, I think he, yeah. I'm not sure, but I think he's part of the people giving... Uh, uh, no, he, uh, he was meant to be part of the, uh, of the people who are giving the course in ecological economics, but he's not, uh, he's not uh, part of the... There is Guido Calfoucault, uh, Alexandre Bess, and the whole team. So he is. Um, he has. Uh, 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 he's thinking about. Uh, oh, and uh, th there was this typo. I'm sorry, but uh, he, he's thinking about uh, the status of current technologies, and he calls most of our technologies right now zombie technologies, and he's contrasting this understanding of technologies, and so most of our infrastructure, devices, and the likes. Had to um, with sorry living technologies, so living technologies and zombie technologies. Why talk about zombie technologies? Uh, zombie technologies are defined as technologies which rely on finite resources with eventually limited availability. Uh, in terms of durability, um, uh, it's minimum in terms of the. Uh, working condition uh, through um, obsolescence or planned obsolescence. Um, distinction here is not necessarily especially important. And in terms of the end of life of these technologies, uh, it's, uh, the duration is maximum because uh, in terms of waste, they just cannot die. And this is why he's calling them zombie technologies. Just like the zombie, they cannot die. They are not part of uh, biogeochemical cycles, um, and so they uh, uh, are not compostable. And they just accumulate um, in uh, uh, our geological strata, along with chicken bones and uh, 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 things made out of plastic. So the current geological strata are made of precious ore, chicken bones, and plastic, which wasn't the case uh, before. It's, it's quite new. And it can only accumulate, and they will never be, and that's the point here, sustainable. They cannot be sustainable for essential reasons. So even if they are made more efficient to produce, to consume, or whatever, even if we can put aside the cost of that, meaning the Jevons paradox, the rebound effects, even then, they will still be zombie technologies. And so he's contrasting these technologies with living technologies, which are based on renewals, um, which will work for a very long time, and whose duration as waste will be minimal because precisely um, they will enter in those cycles I've been mentioning. And so they will be compostable somehow. 
So the problem is that, of course, most of our technologies and most of the technologies that constitute the future we're expecting are zombie technologies. And so technologies um, whose production for the future is not a good idea, who are, as Tony Fry said, I mentioned him, uh, defuturing rather than futuring, meaning they are depriving us from uh, a future, uh, livable future, which of course is, is a problem. So the question becomes, how do we deal with that? How do we deal with the expectations we have put in innovation and technological progress when it's not able to deliver. And it's the case of how do we deal with what I've been calling um, obsolete futures, obsolete innovations. Things that will not um, improve the situation, but quite the contrary, make it worse. Situation is already dire, and there are lots of innovation that are coming that will make it even uh, worse. So how do we deal with that? How do we make things not happen? And we do not teach that in schools. We do not teach that to researchers. Researchers, when they are doing programs, uh, well, at no point when they are doing projects, this question is being raised. There is no institution to raise this question. There is no institution to have this conversation in the research centers, in the university, in the organizations. So it's simply not happening. And we do not know how to do that. We're not trained to do that. We don't have methodologies and the right means to do that. Uh, just a side note about living technologies. It's not just about uh, resilience, and if you want to discuss resilience afterward, um, I will gladly do so with you. Um, the point is not here to use living resources or infrastructures to mitigate the effects of the extractive industry. Maybe you know, but um, the framing offered by resilience, the resilience paradigm, is sometimes to um, exploit the properties of living beings uh, through what is called resilient infrastructures to mitigate the effect of extractivist infrastructures. So we have old-fashioned extractivist infrastructures which are destroying the environment and we're going to use the power of living beings, living non-humans, to compensate for these destructions or to mitigate these destructions. That's part of the resilience um, mode of governance. And for that, about that, I can point you to the work of David Chandler, uh, Stephanie Wakefield, and people like that who have been studying resilience in a very interesting way. And so this means this is only a way to have your cake and eat it, destroy nature, and use it for remediation purpose. The point here with living technologies and zombie technologies is rather to sensibly stop the destruction without threatening people's lives. Uh, there's a French philosopher, Pierre Quay, who published some books uh, over the last few years, and he explains that we should I will not deal with that, but I won't mention it because that's quite interesting in this context. He said we, we should be searching a way out of the production slash destruction metaphysics and that we should talk about in-production or in-production in French, unproduction. We should make room for things which um, are not part of this production destruction uh, alternative. Uh, and, and for him, this is something which is fundamental. And I think he's quite right. And, and shutting things down is also making room for such a dimension. OK, so when dealing with negative commons, I've been proposing this typology of different negative commons. Uh, the notion of ne negative commons is not a metaphysical notion. It's not a, 
um, an ontological notion which will explain that things intrinsically are negative commons. Uh, there are just negative commons once people, communities, acknowledge them as being negative commons. Um, and so you need value judgments, inquiries, in a kind of Deweyan fashion from the uh, uh, American philosopher John Dewey who insisted on the importance um, of inquiry for democracy, the possibility to inquire is a democratic uh, possibility. And so my point is that negative commons are a relational concept and I've been trying to um, explain some of these relationship we can have to these negative commons and some of the answers we can give to the presence of negative commons. Um, just so three elements. Um, there are negative commons that call for, uh, as a raise the question of how we live from now on with them. Uh, for example, if you're taking the uh, issue of um, ecological, uh, sorry, um, um, nuclear uh, waste. Um, once nuclear waste are produced, you cannot um, get rid of them like that. It's not easy, it's not simple. And you will have to find new ways to produce distance uh, from these realities. Uh, so whether you put them in the underground or elsewhere, uh, you will have to recreate uh, zones that people will be uh, forbidden to tread on, right? Uh, and examples are like the Yucca Mountain in the US, even though it has been shut down, I think, um, ever since, uh, or the Onkelo site uh, in Scandinavia, uh, which is supposed to last for um, 100,000 years, which for human infrastructure uh, will be the first time we'll build something that have to uh, last such a long time. So things we cannot ignore, but we have to deal with, but at a distance. There are other things which are sometimes seen as negative commons like uh, viruses, and that's a good example of course right now, bacteria or invasive species. Uh, and often the answer to the presence of these elements is to try to get rid of them, to destroy them. In the case of bacteria, uh, through hygienic measures, or in the case of invasive species, in order to allow endemic species to grow. Uh, but it has been discussed whether or not, in the case, of, for example, of invasive species, this answer is the right one. Should we have as an answer this idea of eradicating this reality or trying to live with it in a different way, depending on the relation we have to, to it? And sometimes in the environments, or what we might better call the milieu, um, which are hospitable for these invasive species, well, sometimes they are uh, welcome because the endemic species have already disappeared and let's say the um, ecological services they provide are welcome in these environments. So the answer cannot always be one, the same, like destruction, utter destruction. So we have to um, find a way to deal uh, with these realities depending on the milieu that welcomed them. So we, we have to find a diplomacy, as Bruno Latour would say, or Baptiste Moiseau, uh, a diplomacy with these uh, beings. Find new relationship to those. And eventually the last one is, um, well, how do we deal with realities that will never be green, that will never be all right, that will never be uh, detached from the destructions they are causing. And among these I uh, mention of course zombie technologies. But of course if ICT are also zombie technologies we cannot get rid of them at once. So how do we learn to detach ourselves from technologies to which we're ever more deeply attached on a daily basis? 
that's of course a very tricky issue. To access some public services, I need a smartphone. So how do I detach myself from the smartphone and the destruction it's causing? That's a very tricky issue. But maybe that's one we should be working on. Um, to answer, it, uh, answer this question, we have been creating some initiative, like the Closing World Initiatives, which uh, we created with my colleague Diego Landiva, which was precisely the attempt to first think about, uh, well, how we shut things down concretely by doing inquiries inside organizations, uh, by proposing new levers of action, as we say in French, um, new institutions, new answers to this, uh, uh, to this question. Um, to repopulate, if I may say so, um, the domain of uh, 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 um, closure um, alongside innovation, uh, repairing, and maintenance. Uh, the answer is also to build new protocols, for example, uh, protocols of renunciations. Uh, this is especially what my colleague Diego Oliva, whom I just mentioned, has been doing for the, 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 the past few years. Um, here is an example of the fresque du renoncement. Um, and uh, uh, so it's a kind of game about renouncing <coughs> and, and, and about how we provide the means for an organization or a collective to think about and reflect upon the issue of uh, not maintaining some activities, renunciating some activities, which is, of course, not natural, right? Um, and to do so, you have to inquire about the attachments that people have to these realities that we will have to um, abandon. Otherwise, of course, renouncing will be brutal and violent. So the first thing is to do inquiries and to understand how people are related to infrastructures, uh, models, and the likes. So we were, for example, uh, with students, I will mention that uh, in a few seconds, and I'm almost already done. Uh, we have been working uh, with the town of Grenoble in France, um, about um, public swimming pools, uh, because a swimming pool is lasting only like 30 or 40 years, and they have a problem with um, uh, swimming pools that are not able to operate anymore. And the question is how do we build new ones, or do we abandon these, or do we, uh, uh, what do we do in this situation? And so. Citizens of the, of the city of Grenoble have been inquiring on their attachment to these elements, to these swimming pools, um, and they have been providing answers to this question. Should we abandon those? Should we renounce uh, uh, these public swimming pools? And what should um, take their place? And sometimes, for example, the point is to take some of these, the properties or the functions of these elements, which are no longer sustainable, and try to implement them in other realities, in other infrastructures, in other sites, in this example. No longer in built, within built infrastructures, built swimming pools, but for example, uh, lakes uh, around Grenoble or other places that people will be able to use in a different way, to find the same properties that they did find in unsustainable infrastructures. So that's one example, but we have many more, because we have been, um, we have been proposing a Master of Science uh, over the last two years, entitled Strategy and Design for the Anthropocene, whose goal is precisely to um, train people in ecological redirection, train people who will be um, for organizations, for collectivities, and territories that will be facing these trade-offs I've been mentioning, who will inevitably 
face this trade-off, this necessity to renounce some of their activities, infrastructures, or realities. As my colleague Emmanuel Bonnet says, um, every organization right now in whatever domain you may think about is like a ski station. Um, not in the Alps, of course, but rather a ski station in um, the place I was living in around Clermont in the Puy de Dome, uh, where they are basically facing the end of their activity and not in many years, but it's just coming. And if you look at every domain, all the domains are concerned, whether it's uh, fashion, whether it's uh, um, uh, um, flying, whatever domain, and we're talking more and more about the unsustainability and the impossibility to even economically maintain lots of activities. So we worked, for example, on stopping new construction in Ile-de-France, so right here, uh, the region around Paris, in order to evaluate not only the possibility and the benefits of this perspective, but also its feasibility, moving towards an economics of renovation um, through the conversion of building into, uh, well, sorry, the conversion of building into inhabitation being one aspect, especially as offices are deserted thanks to COVID adaptation. Um, as I've been mentioning, we accompany the city of Grenoble on the issue of its uh, swimming pools by associating the inhabitants to this investigation, but we also work with ski resorts, uh, who know they are doomed with parking lot managers, with insurers faced with situations that would no longer be insurable under the current conditions and the likes. Last year we have been opening like 15 uh, inquiries with organizations and uh, territories and collectivities. And uh, this year we are opening uh, around 20 of these um, what we call commissions. So. Um, uh, a, a bit more than 30 in two, two years. So we have to walk a fine line, and I'm going to end with this, uh, almost. We have to walk a fine line between two pitfalls, leaving the technosphere unharmed, which threatens the inhabitability of the Earth in the medium term, or cutting tie with it when the survival of a growing part of humanity depends on the technosphere. Following this path between these two pitfalls requires taking into account the imperative of closure as well as the subsistence links woven with what needs to be closed in order to dismantle in the most democratic, fairest and the least painful way. The question of technique of course, is therefore absolutely central from the point of view of, of what we are calling the arts of closure and to which arts we are training our students. To finish, and this will be my last slide, uh, we have to strive uh, towards a general economy of sobriety, what I call general economy of sobriety, because Governments and institutions are already projecting scenarios which integrate sobriety as a fundamental factor. For example, in France, a recent report projects a 40% decrease in energy use by 2050. And it's not an overtly sober scenario. This is not even under the guise of sobriety. That we might discuss if you want. Adaptation will apply to those scenarios of sobriety which are to be implemented for the coming decades, whether or not they are already explicitly discussed in the public sphere. These scenarios themselves aim to mitigate the effects of climate change and planetary boundaries crossing. But sobriety or frugality is seen as somewhat, somehow diminutive which it is, partly, in all fairness. And here it might be interesting to mention another notion, notion of extensive, uh, well, sorry, uh, uh, different from this notion of 
what I will call extensive sobriety. Um, it's a notion put forward by anthropologist Eduardo Vivos de Castro. And currently we work by a young researcher I'm working with, which is a notion of intensive sufficiency. Our imprint or, or the imprint of the technosphere will have to shrink. We cannot grow indefinitely in a finite world as we were, uh, we are every day reminded right now. Um, but maybe for the world to remain livable, we may have to find infinity in the finite uh, world. And that's the point of intensive sufficiency. Through repetition, it is possible to derive enjoyment. Reading a book twice or manifold doesn't require multiplying it. Um, same with playing a musical instrument or playing some games. And so exploring the conditions under which this intensive sufficiency may happen, what I call the general economy of sobriety, is fundamental since uh, the intensive sufficiency is the condition of possibility of the extensive sobriety of these closures. It's a consequence also of these closures I've been talking about uh, today. Also because the poor are much more advanced in this respect. Uh, equity and questions about the distribution of the efforts to be made are also paramount with regard to this general economy of sobriety and these arts of closures uh, which are so important for the future. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, hi everybody. Uh, Thanks, Professor Mona, for your excellent talk. Uh, now it is time for us to get into details about some of the concepts that you used, both in your article and in your talk. Um, this is the outline of our presentation. Uh, I will be talking about two things. Uh, first, metabolic rift, I'm, which I sort of try to relate with waste as negative commons. Uh, and second thing, circular economy, which is now being promoted by so many institutions uh, and also in scholarly circles as a new model of production and consumption. And then Aulia will continue with the comparison of the two terms, living tech versus zombie technologies, and he will also touch upon uh, social innovation as a form of redirection. And as usual, uh, we'll wrap it up with questions and discussions. Uh, first, a couple of remarks about the concept negative comments. Uh, well, I find it quite strong in a way that how it enables us, uh, enables us um, to think um, commons from a completely different perspective, uh, which I think is complementary to the existing understanding of commons as something that is based on shared resources, communally managed, and, and of course within certain understanding of rules and governance. Uh, yet there are certain things that escape our attention, right? And uh, this is what you call realities, and I think this is very uh, a good depiction of, of the case. Uh, and these include waste treatment facilities, these include uh, nuclear power plants, uh, dried up rivers, and also all, the, all other impacts that we can think of, of, of ongoing ecological destruction. Uh, and the whole idea is that the communities may as well reorganize themselves and reclaim control over management of these issues, right? We, and these are the issues we've come to avoid over time. And it is a matter of identification more than anything. To what exactly as communities we should attach negative value, right? Uh, is, it the si is it the ruins as you, as you put it, or is it the system behind uh, those ruins that keep ruining things? Uh, and one way to look at this problem is Waste as negative commons, as you put it in the article, and this takes us to the first time the term appeared in the literature, which is in 2001 by two German sociologists. Uh, now, waste, specifically organic waste, as we understand today, uh, didn't. It, it is it is quite a new concept, right? And it didn't. Um, it wasn't there before the industrial era. Uh, simply because it used to be a part of the reproductive cycles of life and it wasn't the human material that is the residue, residuals of activity, right? And the, which, which has to be destructed. Uh, and this was until free communal labor was replaced with private wage labor, 
Um, and perhaps the first time at such a large scale, this marked the first time the, the erosion of continuity between, between human communities and ecosystems. Uh, and the organic waste itself, which used to be considered as the part of this reproductive cycle, became something external and have to be dealt with. And while I was reading these lines, um, I, I, I asked myself, I found myself asking, didn't Marx talk about this? Um, especially this idea of losing control over not only the resources, but also the waste. Um, and this, this uh, thinking then led me one of the works of John Bellamy Foster, uh, environmental sociologist, where he tried to illustrate Marx had this idea, uh, which I just told you, uh, the, the very rupture between the relation in the relationship between human communities and nature. Uh, and here are some excerpts from his work, uh, quoting Marx about his thoughts on agricultural capitalist agricultural production. Uh, I'm just going to read them as they are pretty straightforward. Again, quoting Marx, capitalist agriculture produces conditions that provoke an irreparable rift in the interdependent process of the social metabolism and metabolism prescribed by the natural laws of life itself. And what are these laws? Man lives from nature, nature is his body, and he must maintain a continuing dialogue with it if he is not to die. To say that man's physical and mental life is linked to nature simply means that nature is linked to itself, for man is a part of nature. And freedom can consist only in this, that socialized men, the associated producers, govern the human metabolism with nature in a rational way, bringing it under their own collective control rather than being dominated by it as a blind power, accomplishing it with the least expenditure of energy and in conditions most worthy and appropriate for their human nature. Now, to visualize what Marx talked about, it was this loss of collective control, the sense, the sense itself, that led to a broken system which keeps producing excess waste and pollution due to excessive uh, use of chemical fertilizers in, in agricultural production. Uh, however, as, as, source, as capitalist societies developed, uh, this return back to earth and bringing the cycle back simply became impossible um, because, there is now, um, because there is now less capacity to recycle what is in excess and what happens is that those excess waste in every form, including toxic form, now being dumped into the realm of the invisible, into the air, into the ocean, into the subsoil, into the economically inferior territories. Um, and in this sense, it's also a matter of scale, right? We're now talking about all kinds of infrastructures that, that are ensuring the treatment of wastes of all kind. Uh, we're talking about nuclear power plants as well. Uh, so this means, I mean, the, the, the thing is that those infrastructures, that those institutions operate within the boundaries of private ownership. It is impossible to talk about any collective control over those facilities, over those structures and infrastructures. Um, and needless to say, waste is now a commodity that is being traded in the global market, right? Which mostly en ends up in, in developing countries because of their raw material needs. Um, so in line with all this, how do we see something like circular economy? that is now being advertised everywhere. Um, I'm, I'm not going into much detail with this, but the idea is pretty straightforward. Uh, the current linear uh, material and energy flow model of, of extract, produce, use and dump is basically unsustainable. Why? Because it is collapsing with the natural limits of our planetary boundaries. And then what do you do? You uh, reuse, you encourage reusing, remanufacturing, recycling that are circulating in the economy. And how do you do that? You optimize resource use, you standardize products for longer use, and you minimize waste creation or basically get rid of waste that you have in the end. Now, some critiques in terms of its limitations already exist in the literature. Uh, first, uh, it neglects the thermodynamic teaching that one neither create nor destroy matter, 
whatever resources are used up must end up somewhere in the environment. So imagining a fully circular economy where you have no waste and you closed all the material loops is simply not possible. Um, and second, as we know, rebound effect. When production efficiency increases by using secondary products or recycled products, that means that the end products will become cheaper, right? And this potentially will boost up consumption. And um, unless you not you're you're not unless you're controlling for the physical scale of the economy of the growth economy, there's always a chance that those efficiency gains will be eaten up by the increase in consumption. Um, and of course, the list goes on. Uh, and maybe most importantly, when we look at from your perspective, your understanding of negative commons, uh, the most important questions to ask become things like, how does this agenda include civil societies and communities' interests, right? How is something that is apparently serving corporate interests through further investments in, in infrastructures that are treating waste, uh, that are adopting further green technologies, how is this going to be how is this going to make or enable communities to reclaim control and over on, on and ownership uh, for all these issues? Um, and Marx called this same issue robbing of soil for the capitalist agricultural production. And we might as well now call this uh, robbing of our collective capacity. Um, and I would like to end my part with a quote by uh, Pierre Darto and Christian Laval. I think it, uh, it accurately describes the main takeaway uh, for your piece. Uh, Nothing would be worse than giving up the right to those who have a profession to enact it. Now I'm giving the floor to Aulia. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Koran. Um, and thank you, Professor Alexander Mona, for your talk. Maybe I will talk, uh, this is current issues that uh, smart city, um, also in Indonesia right now, um, they are moving the capital city uh, from uh, like in the jungle to like this kind of smart city and maybe if you are googling smart city um, maybe you found this way of um, blue skyscraper uh, roads ultra urbanist landscape <coughs> uh, but there are a lack of variation in this result show that our mainstream meaning of futurism um, is connected to a static idea um, so the concept of what we consider futuristic uh, was established in the past and before the urgency of concern like global warming and resource management right now. Um, so I really like your idea about this zombie technology that maybe our future city will be uh, remain as the ruins, as you say. So I, maybe I just summarize what you say about living technology and zombie technologies. This is quite interesting for me when I read your text that um, I really realize that we are living now with um, uh, zombie technologies. Uh, we are depending on smartphone. Like I also like always making uh, technology detox, like something like that, to prevent myself uh, very depending on the technology. And these technology are very lo short lifespan, and after that, they simply refuse to die, as you said. That maybe I just skip this, and also. Your point about negative externality, uh, sorry, negative comments. Uh, this is not same with negative externality because uh, negative externality um, is the concept by economists that uh, always use it as consequences, result, unintended results that uh, interaction between two agents that involve in a transaction. And negative comments is not like uh, this. Uh, negative externality. And also you talk about ruin, ruins and ruinous ruins. And also like um, oil and smartphone and 5G, fossil fuels and supply chain, neoliberal measures, this kind of uh, ruinous ruins that still um, remains in our everyday life. But I just want to point out, uh, there is a political challenge to say that, to identify this um, negative comments into the right category because this is quite a challenge for us um, in the socialist cap society, right? sorry, uh, capital society. Uh, just to put another perspective about political issues, 
to categorize these negative comments. Indonesia right now, um, maybe this is very, very uh, disappointed for environmentalists around the world, where they are uh, categorized uh, coal power, sorry, coal ash as not hazardous. This is, as of course, it's common sense that this is very hazardous, but because they are involved in this political business of uh, fossil fuels and now making governments uh, classify this uh, as as an hazardous. So I just I, I will come up with this maybe another form, emerging form of social innovation that we have uh, uh, currently emerging in developing country or developed country. They put so much uh, intention on human as um, or human-centered approach, or um, and they put maybe you are if you are from business school you know a business model canvas where they don't have uh, impact or purpose in the top, but they there is a new canvas for for social innovation that they put purpose and impact what to integrate your social mission, your, your environmental mission into your business models. This is quite uh, interesting because uh, in Indonesia, for example, so many uh, social innovation emerging right now. Uh, for example, this uh, waste um, from mushrooms, so, uh, sustainable material from mushrooms, where they, they can create another, fo uh, another material for, f uh, for example, Later, yes, um, uh, also fashion, sustainable fashion, and also waste management that creating more jobs. And this is sustainable seaweed based packaging that we can eat our packaging. This kind of social innovation, I will mention that maybe, I don't know, uh, one of the paths for our redirection in the future. Um, also, just to Conclude our maybe this is very new about B Corp certification, where we can put our uh, corporation in the uh, in the big corporation right now to involve in their own responsibility for our environment by putting uh, more not only shareholder shareholder in the center of their uh, orientation but governance workers environment community and customers, um, which is, is this a, a, grew, a growing uh, also movement of B-Lab Corporation, a B-Lab movement, if you are Googling that. Uh, some company like Patagonia, uh, in France, uh, Too Good To Go, um, many, many benefit corporation, big corp certification that maybe one of them will be change our future corporation. But of course, these are critics for this new movement, um, greenwashing, of course, social washing, that using this certification to use their, um, their making a, a image, a good image in the public, and also some critics by Gradarars, they say that this is only another vehicle by traditional system, or tra traditional elite, uh, in this capitalist society, of course, this is um, this is a very early movement. If we want to consider, but there is a potential too. If we want to redirect our ecological and our uh, future um, earth, will be involving in this organization, in this business. We have to put them to have a uh, responsibility for the environment. So this leads us for our questions. You want to? Okay. Yeah. yeah, those are some of the questions we've come up with. Uh, uh, first of all, how do you see degrowth, both as a movement and a body of research in terms of its capability in identifying the negative nature of commonalities, both structures and infrastructures uh, that you mentioned? In what areas it should expand its vision? Second, considering the existing business models as one of the ruinous ruins, as you mentioned, how should we envision their transition for the redirection path? Uh, and the last one, we live in an era which, in which zombie technologies are everywhere, and we tend to depend very much on them, including systems that are too big to fail. 
how can we be more aware and anticipate the future with constant innovation that might fall into this category? What is the role of individual in this? Thank you very much. Thank you. No, you don't need that, I know that. So, um, if you try, could try to deal with that within 15 minutes, that would be very nice, so we can open the floor. Yeah. So, thank you very much. Thank you for uh, all these uh, elements. It was very well, very well done. I'm really grateful, and thank you for these, these questions. Uh, so, I'll try to, five minutes per question, should make the trick. Um, Degrowth is an, it's an interesting question because uh, we seldom use the word uh, degrowth, um, which is getting some traction uh, lately. That's not the first time, but uh, lately there are lots of press. At least in France, about degrowth, there is the uh, work of uh, Timothée Paric, uh, who did a, released a big uh, thesis, PhD thesis on, on degrowth, and will publish a book about that. So. A lot of people talking about it. The difference between our approach and degrowth, there are many of them, but of course we're uh, uh, aware of what is happening within the degrowth cycles. But uh, one important difference is that um, degrowth is mainly a political program. It's not, uh, uh, these are not recipes. Um, it's, it's really a program to convince people to take a certain direction. But imagine you are uh, managing a ski station. And you don't know what will happen because there won't be any snow, the mountains are crumbling, and you're like, my activity has no future, more or less. If the answer is, well, degrowth, well, please um, go into our political movement, we welcome you. That will not be a very operating answer to the issue that you have. And maybe also the people who are confronted by these realities, by these perspectives, uh, do not adhere to degrowth. And probably because still the uh, number of people uh, who are explicitly degrowth militant is quite, uh, quite low. So we have to find ways to help these people which maybe politically are not on the side of degrowth, but who are facing very tangible, urgent questions about uh, what to do with their organizations, their territories, um, uh, and their activities in general. And so we are trying to provide very concrete answers, and at the, I would say, the meso level, while degrowth is interested into, in the, mic the macro level. So it's kind of a political program at the macro level, but it doesn't really have answers uh, in concrete settings. And that's not the main point of the people of the degrowth movement. Also, a difference will be, uh, how should I state it? That some people inside the degrowth movement, um, they confuse criticizing capitalism with acting. So you can criticize capitalism, say you get, we get to read, get rid of capitalism. That is not uh, helping somehow. And that does nothing against capitalism, actually. There are lots of books which are published and, and written about the end of capitalism. And that there is a whole industry, anti-capitalist, industry of books and publications. And so there is a kind of category mistake, um, criticizing capitalism and concretely acting against it are two different uh, things. And, and some of the people inside this movement sometimes are not into um, concrete action. Thank you. Uh, so that will be my, my first uh, my first answer. So they should, yeah, they should expand their vision by making it more practical. Uh, even though it will be interesting to see how we can um, link the meso level with the macro level, 
because of course we also need some macro reflection about what we will need to deploy in terms of political program, economic program, but in terms of action, I think that's too difficult to directly act on the macro level, and that's why they are sometimes powerless to act um, because they, of this uh, uh, problem level. Um, yeah, considering existing business models, how should we envision the transition through redirection path? That's a very good question. Thank you for asking. I didn't mention it, but we are currently working by using some of these uh, business models. Uh, the Canvas has been mentioned. There are others. There is the McKinsey matrix that is used in all corporations about investments. Um, and we are trying to hack these um, uh, models um, because people, managers, people inside organization know about them. They mainly understand uh, the world of their organization through the lenses of these uh, models they are using because they are very generalized. And so one point to operate the redirection is to start from these models and try to add some new dimensions. For example, in the investment matrix, the McKinsey investment matrix, there is just one uh, part dedicated to disinvestment. My colleague Diego Olivar reworked this matrix to just have one part dedicated to investment and all the others to divestment. And so that's one way to help people understand that they will have to take different trajectories by at the same time adapting to what currently constitute their realities. And their realities is full of these matrices, canvases, and, and the likes. So one way to redirect them is to rework from there. And so to go concretely to understand the world of managers, the world of organizations, the world of management in general, and try to um, um, redirect it. Simple as that. So, yeah, very concretely, this is what we're doing. It doesn't answer all the issues, of course, because um, at some point, the trajectories of organizations um, need to, um, how should I say, um, be encased in a macro politics, policy, but still it's interesting to begin the movement at the level of organization. This is something we see where we have, uh, for example, and that will link the two, um, the two, the first two questions with your last point about B Corps. We're currently working with a B Corp company in Quebec, uh, which is advising 20 companies. And what is, it, what is interesting is that part of the discourse that uh, the people inside this company who are adopting ecological redirection, what, they, what, they, what we're saying right now is to companies, stop growing. Part of your problems come from the fact that you have to grow and you have to stop doing that. And this is something that is listened more and more by companies. Of course, it doesn't mean that it will change the uh, Canadian policy in general, but it will shift you know, uh, and show that lots of company will shift towards kind of redirection slash degrowth. And of course, politically, there will be something new uh, that will have to be taken into account. Also, because it's a country that is limiting immigration right now, investing in AI, automatization, and that will not work, at least for small, medium companies. And this is what they are realizing right now. Um, and the last one uh, about zombie technologies, uh, how can we be more aware of those, anticipate the future, of constant innovation? That's a very interesting question. And what should the individual do in this? Well, one way to answer it, and that's very broad, very interesting question. So one way of answering it is to say that think about the triggering of the yellow vest crisis. This was about the cost of um, essence uh, for cars and uh, taxation um, on cars and the use of cars uh, by people who are forced to take their cars to go work, uh, to uh, find a job, to eat and whatever, to socialize, whatever. Because the uh, institute, the, the 
infrastructures in France are organized around the car. It has been decades since they have been organized around the car as the one model that everyone has to follow. For the record, I don't drive, so I, I'm, I'm not generalizing my situation, but uh, yeah, people are attached to these infrastructures. And one way of dealing with that is to deal with the consequences of that at the level of the individuals and to penalize the individuals. And of course, that triggered the crisis. That was a huge problem for the power in France, the state in France. Another answer is, how do we deal in the future with this dependency on infrastructures that should not last? In the future, there should be less cars. And actually, there will be less cars. We all know that. And that's the paradox right now. We are selling and buying, not me, but a lot of people, are buying SUVs, right? The biggest, ugliest cars that have ever been built and sold. And at the same time, we are already planning the fact that cars will no longer circulate in cities, lots of cities, and that the uh, general number of cars in France, but in other countries, will diminish in the coming years. So it's interesting because we're dealing with a lot of these contradictions right now. The fact that there is a contradiction is not necessarily bad. It might actually be good because you can, um, from a strategic perspective, almost a military perspective, you can use this contradiction to advance the necessity to redirect. For example, and this is a, a contradiction in terms of um, the country's policies. There is one policy which is to help selling more cars and one policy to limit the circulation of cars. And at some point this will clash. And in all the domain we're looking, this will clash. So one way to uh, should I say, uh, support the notion of redirection is to look at those contradiction, contradictions and, um, well, of course, wait in on one <laughs> aspect of the contradiction instead of another, right? So that's, that's, that should not, the problem should not be um, at the level of the individual because at the level of the individual, if people have to uh, possess a smartphone to access their basic public services, for example, concerning their health, which is now more and more the case. We have a card in France, which is the um, carte vitale, through which you have access to uh, 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 health services, and this is going to be dematerialized. There are lots of experiments about that going on. So if these services require that you have a smartphone, my point will not be to um, uh, criticize the individuals that do have smartphones because they, have, they are forced to have some. The question rather becomes how do we learn to collectively renounce to technologies? Something we don't know how to do. But what is interesting is that we have learned how to collectively adopt technologies in a non-democratic fashion, like with the 5G uh, debate, where it was the president of France, President Macron, who said, we will adopt 5Gs. No one did elect him to say that. No one did elect the president to adopt the technology for people. And what is very funny is that inside, for example, Orange, uh, so the French, former France Telecom, a lot of people were doubting, and two reports have been written by engineers, doubting the benefits of 5Gs for the business model of Orange. And yet the president says, we will adopt this technology. And maybe that's, a bad, that's bad news for Orange, because the actors that will generate money are not to be found within the actors that are dealing with the infrastructures, but are uh, the platforms and others, right? So it will only be a cost for these uh, French companies. So yeah, we, we lack the means to have a democratic debate about technologies that have been 
the case for a long time. So we need to uh, help new institutions emerge. That was the case a few years ago with the question of pesticides uh, when uh, uh, people from different cities in France took measures to forbid the use of these pesticides. And what was interesting that there was a debate between, a legal debate between these mayors and the préfet, and two different kinds of, um, not credibility, but... Pas la crédibilité, mais la... Pour en démocratique, la... Non, le fait qu'on... Ah, c'est terrible. On a une euh, légitimité. Legitimacy. So there were two kinds of legitimacy. The democratic legitimacy with the mayors and the executive legitimacy of the préfet uh, with the executive power in France. So that was very interesting because that was a debate inside the institution. Not between the institution and what remains outside the institution, but inside the institution. So that's very interesting, and that might be also a uh, prefiguration of lots of debates to, uh, to come. And the last point about that is, why is it very difficult to um, have institutions that deal with technological choices? Because technologies um, are pointing us to dimensions that escape uh, the realm of democratic debate. When we're talking about the smartphone, we're talking about waste that will last for millennia. When we're dealing with nuclear plants or uh, uh, the place where we'll put nuclear waste, as I said, we're dealing with um, infrastructures that are supposed to last for 100,000 years. This is beyond our reach, and this is beyond uh, what we're accustomed to debate politically. It's a dimension that uh, Indian uh, historian Dipesh Akabarti calls the planetarian. It touches on dimensions which are outside the boundaries of the human um, and more planetary dimensions, planetary in terms of the universe, just like on the level, at the level of the planetary, um, oil is a renewable source of energy, but not on a human scale, right? And technology uh, forces us to deal with these scales that escape um, our thinking, our cognition, and our institutions. And of course, that is very difficult. I think I pretty much answered the three questions. Thank you.